Good evening, good morning, wherever you are. My name is uh, David Goodman. I'm the director of the China Studies Center at the University of Sydney. Um, and before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia, recognize their continuing connections to land, water, land, water, land, water, culture, and indeed knowledge, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. To, on this occasion, with our international research webinar, we're very pleased to welcome Olivia Chung, Dr. Olivia Chung, from the London School of Oriental and African Studies, which is quite a reputable university, I'm told. Uh, those of you who know me will know I studied there. And uh, it's a great delight uh, to have her speaking tonight on factionalism in its many different uh, current manifestations. Her chair tonight will be an equally as um, uh, welcome guest, David Kelly who uh, is one of the uh, gurus of China studies in Australia. And uh, he will be the chair and moderator of the discussion that follows. Before I hand over to him, can I just remind you to ask questions at the end, when you do want to ask questions, by using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you put your questions in there, uh, David will then be able to um, look at them and repeat them, uh, pause them uh, to give to Olivia. So over to you, David. Thanks so much, David. Is my, uh, have, have I unmuted myself? Yes. Um, well, I'm very happy to uh, have this opportunity to deal with um, some fresh research and uh, in a very interesting area uh, that is, um, I'm sure, going to be of, of interest to, to all of you uh, who joined us today. Um, I've had the opportunity to see uh, um, quite a bit of um, uh, Dr. Chung's work. Uh, I had not been um, very uh, much in touch with it before. Let me explain that I uh, have only in a, a year or so ago returned from 20 years in Beijing. And when you live in Beijing, you don't have rapid access to all of the world's scholarship and you quickly fall out of, out of, uh, out of date and you're, you're behind the pace and it takes some time to get back uh, up to that. So um, let me uh, minimize the things that I have to say and and uh, go through the notes that I've made and the, the, the points that I think we're going to, we're going to have an interesting time with. Um, all right. Uh, reading through the, the major article that we have from Olivia, which is published in China quarterly, I see a lot of different directions that our discussion might go, but I want to really to Olivia to, uh, to, uh, uh, to set the course. Uh, based on her preferred uh, interests. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is we have a couple of words which um, always raise eyebrows. One is affection, um, and the other is, um, what is it? It's um, model. Uh, and, and Olivia, I think, is, uh, has got a very clear idea of what, of what she means by these things. But, um, Factional approaches to Chinese elite politics have a, a checkered history. Some popular examples that you will read in the, in the media, uh, like leftists and rightists, conservatives and radicals, um, red inheritors of different family groups, um, also meritocrats and um, uh, not so meritocratic. Uh, uh, you, will, you will hear certain names that are attached to, to factions. So there, there's the, um, and there is the well-known party school faction and the princeling faction of 10 or so years ago. Um, uh, Zeng Ching Hong, uh, you'll hear as somebody who works as a factional um, mafiosi or, or conciliary. And you'll also hear about Wang Huning uh, as an intellectual conciliary of um, of the current party leader, Xi Jinping. Uh, but 
these often run into criticisms because um, the, criti the critics will point out how fluid and contingent the criteria for membership are. For instance, Wang Huning has served five uh, party leaders in a row. So how, how can we assign him to a faction? And there are many, many more like that. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the, the, the first th thing that I think Olivia will sh shed a bit of light on is um, how is she how is she using uh, affection uh, and the next thing the other important word is models because she is she's pointing to this fascinating um, syndrome of uh, projects being earmarked uh, in rural China and re or regional China they, they, they can be uh, ru as rural as you like or as urban as you like uh, and they could, or they might center around it, just a particular policy theme. But their point is to display the clout of some group of political actors. And they do this by modelizing them, if we like to use X phrase, that phrase. They, uh, the, and this is reflects something which he points out that um, the, the, the governance system in China, and particularly the ideology, um, often re, uh, has resort to models. There's, uh, you know, there, there's the models of this and models of that. Um, a model of a of a party, uh, a famous party tool, no less, is Lei Feng, who I think is being celebrated probably every, this uh, at this time every year. Um, people remember this uh, this this uh, PLA soldier who um, who sacrificed. Uh, his life uh, for his fellow soldiers. He's a model. Uh, you're supposed to emulate him. Young people are supposed to build their lives around it. Uh, th but model is used in a wider sense of a model project or a model village or a model um, implementation of central policy. So um, these, these terms are being brought together in Olivia's paper. So I, I'm going to stop talking now and, uh, and ask her to elucidate uh, as, as in, in any way that she uh, feels uh, is uh, fruitful. Um, thank you um, to um, David for the kind introduction and for um, Professor Goodman for um, inviting me to share my um, research to um, the audience today. So I will just begin my screen share and start the presentation. And in the middle of that, I hope to address um, the questions that David um, have just raised, um, all very valid and important for understanding China today. Right. So um, as David has mentioned, the presentation is um, shaped largely around an article that I have recently um, published in the China Quarterly. And um, this presentation um, is going to reflect the theoretical framework um, and the empirical analysis that was in the article. And the article is part of a larger book project that I am working on that really look at factionalism and ideology and how they interact and change from the time of Mao Zedong all the way to Xi Jinping currently. And this project, I am undertaking it alongside with another book project that I'm working with um, Professor Steve Sang at um, SOAS University of London, and that project is on Xi Jinping thought. So um, my thought process has been, you know, developing, evolving in the process. And I think um, taking these two projects side by side really help reinforce each other. And David is absolutely correct. Factionalism is something evolving and very hard to grasp in Chinese politics. And, and it also runs into um, many major critics in a sense that um, methodologically, it is a difficult subject. Um, no one would come out and say, I am a member of a faction. And definitely factions are formally prohibited in um, Chinese politics. So how do we analyze something that is officially non-existent and secretive? And the idea on model making is also very interesting. Um, for a very long time, um, scholars of Chinese politics tend to study model making from the tradition of sociology and quite rarely um, have anyone put it in the context of elite politics, which is what I'm trying to do today. 
And a third um, theme that I think is also um, quite intriguing and difficult when we analyze China, but nonetheless very relevant and important is ideology. I mean, what exactly is an ideology? How is it different from just an idea, a policy, or you know, um, politics more generally? So I hope that uh, my discussion, um, which may not have very good answers to those, can nonetheless um, help us unpack those um, complex um, topics and open up a discussion that we can share today in the webinar. So the, to begin with, I would be just asking um, a question, which is, can members of the Chinese Communist Party express ideological disagreements in public? Um, quite a loaded question. And the answer is obviously no. I mean, official answer is no. Um, that is basically Chinese politics 101. It goes against everything we know about um, um, authoritarianism or communism or how the Chinese Communist Party works officially. But the reality is that um, we do see ideological disagreements among very high ranking party members being expressed in public in the party's very long or increasingly long history. So we have the examples of the Cultural Revolution, 1960 to 1970s. There's a major ideological disagreement expressed in public. Um, a, a much milder example that we would all be familiar with was Deng Xiaoping's very landmark um, self tour in 1992, that he, where he came out and said, um, the debate between socialism and capitalism is really obsolete and we need to move on. And that led to um, a jumpstart of China's market reform that was being derailed after the political crisis in 1989. And time and again in China, even under the Xi Jinping era, we see the so-called 10,000 character lectures being issued by some party veterans um, condemning certain aspects of existing policy direction. So all of these suggest that there is an official answer. You cannot express ideological disagreements in public, but at the same time, in practice, in reality, we do see ideological disagreements being expressed. So this observation of mine isn't new. Um, various scholars have obviously studied um, the various instances I just uh, mentioned in great detail. But the problem I have with those is that they gave a very strong impression that these are isolated incidences that are not related to each other. And they are idiosyncratic. They are very specific to personalities and context. So you can't really put it together to have, you know, a, to point to us a coherent picture of how do ideological disagreements get expressed in the party. And what I really hope to do um, in my project, and which is what motivated um, this whole book and the paper, is to develop a theoretical framework that would allow us to analyze ideological disagreements that are publicly expressed um, systematically and in a structural manner. So this um, presentation will take us through um, my thought process on how I do that. And I am going to um, split the presentation into three parts. So in the first part, I will talk about the theory of factional model making, which is the theoretical framework that I come up with to analyze ideological disagreements that are openly expressed by party members. Then the second part, I will very briefly review the history of factional model making. And for most of the time I will spend on the third part, which is to look at um, what I find quite a rich and interesting case study of how that was being done in practice and towards the end, I will reflect a bit on Xi Jinping and what does factional model making mean under Xi Jinping today. And I think um, for our discussion, we can focus on Xi or I'm also happy to answer you know, any aspects that I have covered or have not. So on the theory of factional model making, there has been a very long history in the Chinese Communist Party predating the founding of the PRC where party members um, handpick um, citizens, communities, factories, schools that are considered to be exemplary, you know, embodying some of the values or practices that the party endorses as models. 
it is a very you know structured process on who you select as a model and what do you do after you have selected um, that person or that community as a model how do you promote them and how do you ensure that they continue their best qualities that make them selected in the first place so models we can think of them as examples to be copied they reflect conformity and it also reflect you know um an education philosophy where self-improvement of everybody is possible through imitation. So I think that is very interesting because um, the assumption there is everybody can aspire for the highest possible norm and this is what they should be doing as opposed to simply to avoid you know, evading the law, which is you know, a negative you know, lowest norm. So in Chinese politics, using that you know education philosophy it is always pushing people to drive towards excellence by focusing on a single or several targets who are models so models then is a form of control and then we have factions which seem to be the opposite of models now factions um, make us think of you know divisions you know disunity the party not really coming together it's not the kind of operation of the CCP that they want us to see. But like factions are real in Chinese politics and I'll go through that a lot more in my um, case study. Now for the time being, what is factional model making? So quite simply factional model making um, is a practice that is evolving from model making. So a practice that where factions appropriated, subverted, a party endorsed method of promoting conformity and make it into a platform for waging ideological conflict and also using it as an instrument for power signaling. So what happens is a faction and um, factional elites, they handpick a local area that implement a policy marginalized by the party line and then they assist the local area to obtain resources that are very hard to come by in order to cultivate that local area into a successful example of a particular policy and that policy being extremely controversial in China and also reflect an ideology that is distinctive from the party line. And then those party elites being important in politics themselves would personally come to these models which are you know, local places to give their endorsement. And, we are, and when they are there, they make public speeches. That I argue is a you know, verbal discursive form of waging ideological conflict. And what is quite significant are that those speeches they make and their very visitation to those areas are all public acts. And hence, I can see that as a public form of expressing ideological disagreement as opposed to what they might express behind closed door, which we have no knowledge of. So in that sense, factional model making is an important instrument for power signaling. And why is power signaling even necessary? Well, the clear answer to that is Chinese politics is not um, strongly institutionalized. Institutionalization has rolled back significantly under Xi Jinping. But even before him, from the Mao era all the way to before Xi, institutionalization in Chinese politics um, is weak. And what that means is holding a top office, you know, having a particular title, doesn't necessarily guarantee that you have the power that comes with that title. What it gives you is an opportunity to work towards legitimacy so you can hold real power. And once you do get to that point, now there's a lot of fluidity already, whether you lose it or you keep to that power, um, is something that can evolve. So because of that uncertainty, the need for power signaling to show everybody that you are still firmly in charge, so don't get into my way, is significant. So that is the theoretical premise of where factional model making comes in and why it is necessary. And importantly, we have to distinguish factional model making from what other colleagues have um, labeled local policy experimentation, including uh, many of our colleagues in Sydney and in, and in Australia who have done fabulous work on that. So factional uh, model making 
is top down and the agenda is really for power signaling and ideological conflict is highly political. And local policy experimentation is different. It has a much more bottom up process and it doesn't aim to challenge policy goals established by the center. But what it wants to is to do something a lot more technocratic, find, finding the best means to implement a policy with the goals already established by the center. This is to say that the power element of factional model making is significantly stronger than local policy experimentation. And hence, I think they are conceptually two very different things. The Chinese Communist Party has a very rich history of factional model making. Um, if we take a starting point to be late 1960s, it doesn't, it can be even earlier, but if we pick that as a starting point, because it was a time where divisions from the party are becoming increasingly obvious and Mao's previous power monopoly was being increasingly challenged, then we start to see a lot of models emerged. And um, one famous model was called Tao Yuan, and it was a model um, championed by the wife of the state chef, the state leader at that time, Liu Xiaoqi. Um, Tao Yuan's model was championed by his wife, Wang Guangmei, to promote uh, Liu Xiaoqi's own approach to the socialist education campaign. And Liu Xiaoqi's approach was ideologically distinct from that of Mao's. So the Tao Yuan model then is a way um, to challenge really Mao's take on what socialist education mean and how that should be conducted. And shortly after Tao Yuan was promoted in 1964, um, Mao handpicked Da Jai as a national model, and there was a very long running campaign where the whole country was asked to learn from Da Jai. And Da Jai is distinctive to Tao Yuan, completely different in their ideological standpoint. And under Da Jai, Mao also managed to revive some of the more radical practices of the Great Leap Forward. And some of Mao's colleagues um, who have different ideological persuasions handpicked their own model, um, Xiao Jinzhuang and Xiang Xiang, as satellite models of Da Jai. So they both claim that their models are based on Da Jai, but in fact, they are different from Da Jai. But the point being that they are trying to push their own ideological agenda by using an acceptable language, Da Jai. But nonetheless, um, they are not loyal to Da Jai. So at that time, there was a phrase, you know, um, that was really popular in, in China, which is, you know, raising the red flag to undermine the red flag. So Da Jai is the red flag. And you have different ambitious politicians pushing their own agenda in the name of Da Jai, but actually it's not about Da Jai. So model making get really confusing. And the confusion of model making just continues with decentralization and pluralization of politics in the post Mao era. A very, very famous and important model is Xiaogang village in Anhui province, which started the decollectivization movement in um, agriculture and really Chinese politics or Chinese economy more generally speaking. And they implemented a system known as the HRS or household responsibility system, which eventually led to um, the dissolution of the people's commune. So the decollectivization of agriculture all together. Then you have other models um, that are picked on various aspects that I have listed um, on the slide today. And what I would really, really focus on are the red model villages, um, which would be um, what my case study is about. But for the time being, I'm looking at the list. There are two things I want to point out. The first thing is, um, there are in fact like informal norms regulating factional model making. Now, when I look at all these like models that I've listed in great details, which I do um, in the book I'm writing, um, what I do see is that although there are no you know, formal regulations on how do you go by in factional model making, and obviously there isn't, if factions formally do not even exist, but I do see party members who carry out the practice seem to be following certain rules in the way they are do, going about doing it. And the fact that I am looking at cases for over five decades and I see a pattern recurring again and again suggests that those norms are held and respected by and large. The first norm is that no policies prohibited instead of marginalized by the party line should be used. 
So model making is a means to contest ideology in question by promoting a policy that is marginalized but not prohibited. So in, in that sense, model making is not as subversive as it is and is strictly speaking not illegal, given that um, in Chinese Communist Party, there is a very strong culture that central policies can be adapted for local circumstances. So this is a form of adaptation, arguably speaking, but it has a strong political ideological agenda behind it. And the second norm that I see emerging is that the officials who are using factional model making to push their agenda should not do it in a way that also explicitly help them to bid for a position in the party leadership. And those are two norms that I see being respected most of the time, but there are exceptions. So um, one major exception is obviously the famous Guangdong model versus Chongqing model um, saga from 2008 to 2012, leading up to um, the 18th Party Congress where Xi Jinping came to power in late 2012. So in the process, we do see um, Bo Xilai, um, the very charismatic leader of Chongqing, using the Chongqing model to fan up a personality cult of himself. And that was very explicit. And when Bo Xilai was being purged, the official answer, I mean, the official you know, verdict made no mention to the Chongqing model. But I do find an interesting article um, by Guangming Daily, which is one of the high level official mouthpieces that criticizes the Chongqing model as a political model and call that a model of the cultural revolution that personalizes politics. So that shows that if you use factional model making to you know, fan up a personality cult for yourself, to bid for a post in a top party leadership, then you are crossing the line. That's a bit too far and it's not okay. But as I said, the norms of factional model making are largely respected, although I have just pointed out cases where they were not. And the fact that they were largely respected meant that they did not challenge the party leadership's authority in most cases. And for that reason, it has been tolerated for a long time. But to complete the explanation of why the party allows such a practice that obviously deviate from what the party officially allows, um, we also have to look at the weak centralization in Chinese politics from the late 1960s all the way to the present, where you really do not have one central leader who can hold all the power and who can rule without any form of collective input and decision making. And whether that has changed under Xi Jinping, that's something that we would definitely visit towards the end. Now going to my case study. My case study is of a village called Nanjie or literally South Street in Henan province in central China. And there is a bit of history to get us ready for the case study. In 1982, Nanjie village followed the party line at that time, which is to decollectivize agriculture, by implementing the household responsibility system. And the narrative at that time we have throughout China and also research um, done by scholars on the ground was that the HRS was extremely popular throughout China. And not only, not only that the farmers love it, but also that it really increased agricultural output in China significantly. So in a sense that it led to economic growth and people were happy a much better state than Maoist people's communes. But in Nanjie village, the situation was very different. Decollectivization failed Nanjie even early on. There was a sharp decline in agricultural output and there was very significant tension between the local residents and the local party committee shortly after decollectivization. So as the situation continued to worsen, the local party committee at that time made the decision to carry out recollectivization, i.e. they are going to abolish the household responsibility system, have all the land collectively managed by the party committee again, and residents, they are being assigned to work in collective farms rather than you know, farming their own land as they wish. So everything become a lot more centralized and collectivized again. And HLS, although that was the national policy, was abolished in Nanjie on its own initiative beginning in 1984. And to the local party committee, 
um, in order to really push people to, you know, like accept that, you know, taking the land ownership, land management rights away from them is something okay to do. They launched a ideological campaign to learn from Lei Feng, um, study Mao's works and sing revolutionary songs. And in that context, at that time, it was very controversial because the whole of China was trying to move away from Mao's, you know, radical policies and heavy focus on ideology. But clearly we have a village here which is really standing out and doing something quite different. Now, Nanjie started to recollectivize in 1984, but it really didn't come into any focus by regional, regional or national leaders until the early 1990s. And the background to that was um, the initial problems of the household responsibility system, which we saw in Nanjie, um, gradually become something that we see more and more um, throughout China, as the household responsibility system was um, getting more mature, the problems that come with that also become increasingly obvious. So then there was a high level internal debate on whether or not um, we should abolish the household responsibility system and carry out recollectivization. And there has been research suggesting that um, the premier at that time, Li Peng, in fact had a decree drafted that said we should um, abolish the household responsibility system and recollectivize. But that decree was not being released because there were opposition against Li Peng from doing so at the higher up. Because although the HLS didn't work very well in practice in an economic metric, but it was nonetheless very popular with farmers. And the idea about going back to a Maoist system of collectivization simply um, doesn't go well in a popularity sense. The farmers were genuinely terrified. So in that sense, the, the debate about recollectivization or not was stored at the high level. And it was in that context that we see Nanjie really rising out from the policy margins. It began with Chiao Shi, who is a high ranking party official visiting Nanjie in 1990, offering Nanjie you know, very strong endorsement. And after Chiao Shi's visit, um, Nanjie completed recollectivization, which had started in 1984 within just two months using coercive tactics. Eventually what happened was um, the party leader came out to say, if you disagree with us taking over your land, then you are out, you are expelled from the village. And so the coercive tactics succeeded in completing recollectivization. And at the same time, after Tiao's visit, um, the timing, was, was really, really neat. You see Nanjie received a windfall of resources from upper level um, government ministries. Um, some of them are free and some are highly concessional, you know, loans and grants and so on. And under this environment, Nanjie became very successful economically. And it started to have, you know, a very large network of factories, mostly food processing factories, and they were extremely successful. So Nanjie managed to have strong agriculture and on that basis, increasingly strong um, industry as two sources of income. And in 1991, Nanjie's you know, total um, output exceeded 1 billion Chinese yuan and became the first red billionaire village in Henan province and quite likely China as well. Now, Tiao Shi's intervention can be seen as his way to give more credibility to Li Peng's decree, but it was unsuccessful eventually. Li Peng's decree was not issued. However, there was a limited compromise in the sense that the party leadership agreed that although we are not abolishing the household responsibility system, there would be limited um, recollectivization, sorry, not be collectivization, limited recollectivization in the sense that collective agricultural facilities like irrigation and sprinklers, they would be collectively managed. So there is more collective man management under previously a completely um, decollectified system. And follow following Tiao, we have another you know, really high ranking leader, um, Song Ping visiting Nanjie in 1995, making a very similar message to Tiao. And besides high-ranking civilian leaders, we see military generals um, flocking to Nanjie as well. And the trend was started by um, Jiang Aiping, a former defense minister. So he backed Nanjie for the first time in 1994. 
He praised Nanjie for persevering in socialism and claimed that what Nanjie does, you know, recollectivization on the basis of abolishing the household responsibility system is really the only path for China to achieve common prosperity. And Zhang also pushed um, the CCTV, Chinese Central Television, to broadcast a documentary on Nanjie, which was produced by Henan Television. And Zhang's plea to the CCTV was unsuccessful, but he managed to make this you know, privately public by um, successfully um, making the People's Daily um, an official mouthpiece at the party center to publish his plea to um, CCTV. In 1994 as well, Yang Dezhong, who is also um, a general, very high ranking in the party, organized Nanjie's um, local leader, Wang Hongbin, to make a major presentation in Zhongnanhai in Beijing with before over a hundred central cadre. And Wang Hongbin is very proud of that occasion, obviously. And if you go to Nanjie today, you will see a video broadcast on loop where Wang Hongbin recalled what Yang Dezhong told him including you should be resolute in your belief that Nanjie is doing the right thing and that it is mistaken to believe that we should not talk about communism. In fact, we haven't talked enough about it in recent years. So are Zhang Aiping and Yang Dezhong really true communists? Do they really believe in what they say? Are they true socialists? Well, we can't get into their mind precisely. We, don't, we can never know what they really, really think. But what is important is that their signal, their support for Nanjie served an important power signaling purpose. It showed that although the party's left, which is being marginalized by the party in the early 1990s at that time, although they are marginalized, they can still sway the party line. They are still influential if they want to be. And following Zhang and Yang, there were over 200 um, senior military officials visiting Nanjie in the years after, all the way into the 2000s. And Wang Hong being Nanjie's local leader is politically very attuned. So seeing that um, this is the line that the military leaders are pushing, he launched a campaign called Building a Small Community of Communism from 1994 to 1995, when in the process he made a lot of public remarks that really echoed the sentiments that Zhang and Yang were giving. And those remarks criticized the market reform as an attack on collective ownership. And most importantly, he really phrased his remarks as an ideological language and give a strong sense that he is guarding communism in the party while, while the party as a whole has lost its direction. Now, moving on to the late 1990s, we see that Nanjie's factional coalition expanded. And I think this is the interesting thing about the fluidity of factions and how discursive and performative they can be in expressing conflict. So at the beginning, we see Mao Xinyu, who is the grandson of Mao Zedong and a famous writer, Wei Wei, um, joining hands together to, to launch a book series in Nanjie that um, really glorify Mao. And since then, um, that happened, I believe, in 1998, um, we have Maoists coming back to Nanjie repeatedly. And Maoists include um, Mao's um, family members and Mao's personal assistants. And one of the major examples was a visit made by Mao Xiaoting, who is the niece of Mao Zedong. She led a team of over 40 um, members from her organization called China Red Culture Association visiting Nanjie, where they actually staged a performance. And Wang Hong being Nanjie's leader, I really knew how to act you know, appropriately in that context. He gave the status of honorary residence to quite a lot of the visitors from Mao Xiaoting's delegation in that process. And he has really successfully secured Mao Xiaoting's patronage. And Mao Xiaoting returned to Nanjie repeatedly over and over again and call herself a volunteer promoter of the Nanjie village. And attracting the Maoists to Nanjie, I mean, important Maoists is important because with them, a lot of grassroots Maoist association in Chinese society also organize, you know, package tours to Nanjie. And some of the names of these associations I put on the slide. And I think for the Maoist, um, Nanjie is very valuable to them because they do not have, most of them do not, 
a very formal or high-ranking position in Chinese politics, although most Chinese citizens would see them as a special class of political celebrity because of their connection to Mao. So Nanzia gave them an accessible platform to cultivate a persona that they desire um, and to show that they are legitimate stakeholders in Chinese politics. Another very interesting group of factional patrons for Nanzie are the princelings, um, who are the descendants of the founding generation of the Chinese Communist Party. And they only stepped into Nanzie after um, a major scandal that really rocked the village in 2008, where there was a newspaper in Guangdong um, publishing a paper trail that suggests that, in fact, Nanzie has secretly privatized. Um, but it hasn't told anybody. So although it's said that it is a communist village, well, it's actually a lie. So that was a very bad scandal, um, which the local party leader has um, refuted. They said uh, the privatization happened only on paper to comply with new business registration requirement. And they still really believe in socialism and everything they does is a socialist um, template for doing things. So the princelings came in their groups of exclusive societies with the two names I listed on the slide. They came there to express endorsement to Nanjie after that scandal. And I think the, the motivation that really drive them to push Nanjie is that um, Nanjie represented, you know, what socialism should mean in a pure form, you know, everyone is entitled to um, generous welfare provision, the party committee provide for the people, arrange jobs for them. And Nanzie always, you know, come up with an image that everyone is living harmoniously together. And the local leaders set an, set an example, they kept their salary at around 200 yuan. So it's very, you know, egalitarian in a sense. And the princelings like that because it's a good story of what the Chinese Communist Party is, you know, serving the people wholeheartedly. And I think what really revealed their true intention comes in um, a quotation that I have from um, Chen Xiaolu, who is a princeling. He said, um, most of us um, belong to the red second, gener red second generation, i.e. the princeling. They don't have power or wealth, and they really resent the arrogance of the rich second generation. The rich second generation refers to um, the sons and daughters of the current party, um, high-ranking party officials, while the red second generation are the sons and daughters of the founding party generation. So what they are saying is, you know, the media portray, or there's a lot of, you know, negative public sentiment that, you know, um, offsprings of Chinese Communist Party members are abusing their position to gain commercial advantages. But really, it's not us who do that. It is the sons and daughters of some of the current party leaders, some of the current party members, but not us, the much older generation of descendants from the Chinese Communist Party. So this is significant in a sense that Nanjie provided them with a really valuable symbol to vindicate their own identity of who they are. And if we take um, a step back and look at the wider context, in 2009 and around that period, the princelings are not exactly in power. The Chinese leader at that time, um, Hu Jintao, is not a princeling. And his faction, um, the Chinese Communist Youth League faction, most of the members there, they have no princeling background. So in a sense, even princeling as a whole, how established they are in Chinese politics has not been formalized. And their legitimacy is increasingly being challenged in Chinese society. So in that context, having a site, you know, a village where they can come there, make public speeches and appear to be, you know, really doing the right thing for the people is an image that they quite like to project. Since 2012 with um, Xi Jinping coming to power, we see that Nanjie village is gradually shifting from a factional model to a de facto party model. And the first major sign of that is that Henan province turned Nanjie into a training base for party education and poverty alleviation, two of the priorities for Xi Jinping. They don't talk about abolishing the household responsibility system again, which is a system that Xi Jinping said 
would be persisted in the long term. And when Mao Xinyu visited Nanjie in 2018, it praises the village for being on track for accomplishing the China dream under the guidance of not only Mao thought, but also Xi thought. So the idea being that Nanjie's leaders, Nanjie's patrons are gradually shifting their rhetoric from criticizing the party for betraying socialism to, to portraying itself as a loyal village that follows the party's direction of travel. And this is what I meant by Nanjie gradually turning into a de facto party model. And why would Nanjie do that? Well, a clear explanation would be um, continuing being a factional model simply is not an option. Within the first month of taking office in late 2012, Xi Jinping issued an injunction against questioning the reform and opening up and the socialist nature of Chinese socialism, which is exactly what Nanjie has been doing since um, the early 1980s. So that is explicitly banned. And in 2015, um, disparaging the politics and principles of the party center was made a punishable offense. I mean, it shouldn't, it has never been allowed officially, of course, but now it has been a lot more black and white that this is not okay. And in the new Xi Jinping era, the two terms that get constantly promoted in the official rhetoric are political discipline and political protocols. In essence, following the direction set by the party center, do not do your own thing, go, go your own way. Challenging the party center is out of the question. And the most important political discipline or protocol is really to uphold the status of Xi Jinping as the core leader of the Chinese Communist Party. So Xi Jinping has made a very clear um, direction or position on a particular policy, challenging that policy or the broader ideology underpinning that policy is really um, not possible. So that suggests that factional model making um, is, you know, a, a dying technique in a sense, it's not being practiced under Xi. However, it also depends on what you see, what Xi is doing. Are the models that Xi Jinping promote factional models? I mean, Xi Jinping has his own models. Um, for example, Zhejiang province as a model for common prosperity, or Jingjingji, you know, Tianjin, Beijing, Hebei, that city cluster that is being developed allegedly um, as an example of Xi Jinping for to show the future of a prosperous uh, metropolis in China, um, do you see those models as factional models? Do you see those as you know pinpointing a particular ideology, and are those ideology basically um, challenging an existing um, dominant ideology that is in the party? So that is something really open for discussion, and I think. Um, to conclude, to sum up very quickly, are the implications of the suppression of factional model making. Um, factional model making, as I've shown surveying the party history, is something very rich and well established in the party with over you know, five decades of continuous existence. So by not allowing that from happening, the risk is that Xi Jinping has also taken away a very non-regime threatening, low cost form of open expression of dissent. Now, when you take it away, um, is it sustainable? If high level party members think that they have a right to do that, I mean, do they still think that um, under Xi Jinping era or do they no longer think so because they now come to recognize that, you know, having a core leadership and not challenging the core is really important for the party and for the country. So these are questions that are quite open-ended. And I think I'll leave it to um, David to um, bring us to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much.